May the words that are heard be thine and not mine. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The mountain is mighty, great and tall, offers shelter to all creatures large and small. The clouds dance on the great mountain's top, whispering to the mountain to never stop. Never stop reaching towards the endless sky, making a home where the eagles fly. The mountain was forged with one direction in mind. It always looked upward and never behind. We can learn from the mountain. A great lesson is taught. Looking in any direction, we will become distraught. Look in all distractions or directions, we cease to grow, forgetting the mountain's lesson, one which way to go. Just follow the mountain. Allow yourself to be led, and then the clouds will dance around your head, blinding you from the problems that cause you such sorrow. The mountaintop offers a better tomorrow. Whenever you look downward, all you will see is pain. So look upward like the mountain. You have everything to gain. L.T. Paget. Well, to, this evening marks the end of our epiphanal season. We actually enter into Lent on Wednesday. And as Lent fast approaches, approaches us, we come to this last Sunday of Epiphany. Traditionally, our final Sunday of this bridge season between Christmas and Easter affords us an opportunity to consider the transfiguration, particularly Christ transfigured as Messiah. Well, oddly enough, this is not Transfiguration Sunday. We have that during the common days after Pentecost, but we take a different look at the transfiguration tonight. What was revealed about Christ as Messiah? As mentioned before, Matthew recounts this happening with an agenda in mind, and there's probably no clearer indication of our author's intent, intent than tonight. So what happens is Christ and a select few, they make their way up to the top of Mount Tabor, and they've barely gotten there when this incredible manifestation occurs right before their eyes and in dazzling fashion, Matthew said, Christ becomes. And then these other two people appear. And it's Moses on one side and Elijah on the other. Moses representing the Torah, the law, the Levitical code, all the sacraments, all the temple stuff. And Elijah, the prophecy. All of that foretelling for so long that spoke of this coming one that would be the anointed one. Now this must have freaked out Peter, James, and John. I mean, it would have me. Now, were, would they instantly die now because they were in the presence of such great glory? Or was this some sort of judgment where they would be... Uh, They'd have to stand against the law and against all the prophets at the same time, which no one can stand before that, so then they would die. Rather, a bombshell revelation is graced to them, and what a privilege. Matthew's agenda of fulfilling prophecy and completing the law is on display right there. Here's Jesus standing between the two. very important pillars of the Jewish faith, law and promise. At that time, it would be safe to say that everything about Jude Jewish living was about those two points. They're going to keep the law and keep being faithful until Jesus comes. And how are we going to know Jesus is coming? Because the prophets told us it was going to be all this stuff. So ever, ever mindful, I mean keenly mindful, of these two bastions of Judaism. And there's Jesus standing before them. Nothing had ever connected the two before. 
They were two separate yet massive institutions within Judaism. And there's Jesus completing all of the law and fulfilling all of the prophecy. Amazing. Again, I would say, if you were a Jewish person of that time, this would have been mind-blowing. Not just that these two people who have been dead for a long time now are all of a sudden just hanging around with Jesus and they're just chatting it up. But all of this symbolism would have been way too much. Way too much. And so Peter thinks, oh my gosh, this is fantastic. I'll build us some little, you know, tent type things. This little, these, he calls them dwellings in Matthew today. Um, uh, the um, Feast of the Tabernacles is another exa example of that where they would build this temporary shelter and they'd go out there and they would say their prayers. Well, so he is, hey, wow, this is fantastic. Why don't we stay here forever? You can't stay on the mountaintop forever. And so about that time, here comes God out of heaven the way God will do, especially in, uh, relative to any kind of Old Testament kind of understanding, with this roaring, booming voice, this is my son, and I really like him, and he's going to be okay, so listen to him. So consider what happened. Christ invites them first to come up on the mountain. Come up on the mountain. Now, I think L.T. Paget, the poem we read earlier, would agree. That mountaintop experiences are a common adage in spiritual vernacular. We've used this phrase a lot. Oh, it's a mountaintop experience. We talk a lot about that when we talk about Curcio, that it's a mountaintop experience. I went up on the holy mountain for seminary. That wasn't a mountaintop experience. <laughs> the, so the beginning of this, the genesis of this idea of mountaintop experiences comes from today, from our lessons. Basically, we have this deep experiential and spiritual occurrence, believing to have peaked in our souls, reached some ethereal apex. Are you guys familiar with Henry Nowen? Henry Nowen? Wonderful. He says that some experiences complete the unity that's within us and around us. It may happen on a literal mountaintop or a walk in the woods or the birth of a child or the death of a friend or during quiet meditation or intimacy with someone dear when everything fits and all you've hoped for is here and it's real and it's unmissable. It's a mountaintop experience. He continues that this fullness of God is granted so that we may remember in those valley times what it was like when God was near us. At that point when God seemed so far, we'll remember the mountaintop experience. And it has this escalating effect. So, especially if you think about it relative to the basin below, the valley below. Ugh, ugh. And we're all familiar with that, right? We all have to go through that in life. And then all of a sudden you're lifted up to this high mountain spot, okay? But guess what? Peter and James and John didn't get to stay up there either. And we all end up back down in the valley. And then it seems like it's even harder to get up to the top. But this time we're elevated even higher. And you see how that continues to go as we are wanting to become more like Christ. The poem said our focus is up we keep our eyes up and that's when we rise to the mountaintop remember Peter when he sank down in the water kept his eyes up it's a good thing because he was going down pretty quick and Jesus pulled him out of the water Jonah went down into the well Jesus went down into the tomb so we all hit the bottom and then we come back up. It's been said that these experiences transform our hearts. They elevate us from lukewarm to really on fire spiritually. We've all had those times when we just feel so, we, we just feel like we're, we're full of this different sort of realization than we've had before. Christian, the Christian narrative,
history, uh, uh, just walk right through the Bible, through all the historical books, through all the prophetic books, something at some point in a climactic moment will take place on the top of a mountain somewhere. And that's why in ancient times it was very important that uh, mountain tops were considered to be closer to God. Mount Olympus is where all the gods, the Greek gods, hung out, right? And they ordered euros to go. But so up there, they're, they're up there on the mountain, right? That's where they built their temples. They never built them down in a valley somewhere. Hey, here's a good low spot. Water will rush in. This is a great place for a temple. They always built them up high, right? They built them up high. So in this time, you can look and see that Christianity starts off and, and you have Noah. The ark landed where? Then you have Moses. No, no, then you have Abraham and the patriarchs who are constantly up on top of mountaintops. And then you have, after those guys, Moses. Then after Moses, you get Elijah and the other prophets. Elijah was up on the mountaintop several times. Most of the time he was running away to try to get out of trouble. And then you, here comes Jesus. And Jesus was on the Mount of Olives. Today, Mount Tabor. And where did it all point and direct? Golgotha, another mountaintop. The history of mankind led to that one moment that changed everything. Mountaintop experiences. We find ourselves jumping from one summit to the next. The crests of ascent from what has been deep basins below. We need those highs to sustain us when we hit bottom. Did you hear Exodus earlier? Jason said, come up to the mountaintop and wait on me there. Next thing, after all that went down, and the dejected voice comes out. God says, listen to him. Hey, you might want to listen to what this guy's got to say. He was the word. You hear the word. It's another common theme throughout Scripture. Word coming from God, being heard by creation. How was all of this created? It was spoken into being. The Word. How about the Word through Moses? How about the Word through the prophets? How about the Word that called the children of Israel in the first place? How about the fact that we even have Word in a written format now? The Bible. How about the Word, the ultimate, purest, truest uh, manifestation of the Word was Jesus Christ, the incarnate Christ, Jesus who understood the barren times and the wastelands and those low periods of our being empathetically. Well, these guys, they were gifted with this opportunity to experience a sampling of the end game. These three, along with all the other followers of Christ, including me and you and everybody else that follows Christ, we also go through difficult times. And we can look back at moments like this in Scripture, these mountaintop times, and it's almost like it's a road map or a Google app that, that shows you the direction that you need to go. The destination point is to become like Christ, transfigured like Christ. And that objective is an objective that lasts to the end of our life here. And then we go rest high on that mountain. Our work on earth is done. Go to heaven a shouting, love for the Father and the Son. Vince Gill. Last, he told them, well, actually, he told, he told them to tell, but actually told, told them not to tell until Christ had been resurrected. So I have some really great news for you. That restriction has been lifted. 
Christ is raised. And now it's time for us to go tell. It's the charge that was given to James, Peter, and John. It's the same one given to us, that we communicate this to the world. Share the good news. Speak the grace of our Lord. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is reborn.